Welcome to the Forward Together webinar series, brought to you by the School of Management at California Lutheran University. The series is designed to bring interesting topics and people to our global community of students, alumni, and leaders in business and government to empower, educate, and inspire. Forward Together features experts from industry with the purpose to spark thought, connect people, and stimulate engaging discussions. Please submit your questions in the chat. We will hold a Q&A immediately following the presentation. Hello all and welcome to this webinar. My name is Sabit Khan and I'm the program director of the Masters in Public Policy and Administration program. Uh, before we start, I thought I'd give you a very quick rundown of what our program is. We are housed in the School of Management and we, are, we, we prepare uh, young professionals to serve uh, both the nonprofit as well as the governmental sector at the local, state and federal levels. Uh, this is a quick uh, rundown of where our students end up eventually after graduation. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of the skills that you learn in our program, we, we train uh, professionals to enter public service as effective leaders with strong leadership and management skills, with the skills, requisite skills to do research and also conduct policy analysis. Uh, and more importantly, do all of this with the ethical perspective to have a lens of uh, trying to look at problems as a problem solving exercise uh, rather than just ticking boxes and doing what they have to do. And we are really geared to bridge this gap between theory and practice and have been around for many, many years and hope to serve the local community uh, in, in the decades to come. Next slide, please. In terms of our uh, program requirements, we are a, a 39 credit program and have uh, five core classes as well as uh, eight uh, electives. And uh, one of the requ uh, core requirements, which has changed as an exit requirement, is our capstone module. And today you'll hear from Greg Safian, who is graduating this May. And the project you're about to hear from and the subsequent discussion that will follow is actually a capstone project. And in fact, uh, Greg helped us pioneer this model uh, with his uh, analysis of the restaurant industry. So uh, thank you. Next slide, please. So with this, I want to introduce the panelists for today, uh, who is a very stellar uh, panel here uh, with very rich experience and insights. Let me start with Ms. Jessica Kim, who is the Vice President of Economic and Workforce Development at the LA Economic Development Council. And she provides strategic direction and leads LAEDC's collaborative efforts with business, education, and workforce ecosystems to support a growing, equitable, sustainable, and resilient economy. Uh, Leveraging her expertise in convening business leaders to understand and meet their operations and labor needs, uh, Jessica leads one of the most effective small business assistance teams in the country and has attracted, retained, or helped create more than 245,000 direct jobs for LA County residents in firms directly assisted by LADC. Welcome, Jessica. Next, also from LADC, we have Ms. Shannon Sedwick, who's the director for the Institute for Applied Economics. Uh, she is, uh, in this capacity, she oversees and executes planning and data, uh, planning and design of economic research projects and develops subject specific information and data interpretation for economic impact, demographic, workforce, and related uh, analyses. Uh, her work focuses on demographics, industry clusters, contribution analysis, and occupation analysis. Welcome, Shannon. Uh, and then we have Ms. Mr. Steve Mermel, who is uh, the city manager of the city of Pasadena. He was appointed city manager by a unanimous vote of the city council and assumed his duties on February 15th, 2016. And as city manager, he is the chief administrative officer of the city and is charged with supervising, coordinating, and administrating the various functions of the city. And he's also responsible for all the departments, divisions, and offices of the city with the exception of the city attorney or prosecutor and city clerk, which are separately appointed by the city council. Welcome, Steve. And last but not least, we have our own Greg Safian, our MPPA student who is graduating this May. And as I said earlier, this project is based on his capstone project. So we are delighted and happy to have Greg, uh, who will take over the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Khan, for that introduction. And I'd like to uh, start by thanking 
Cal Lutheran University's MPPA program and Steve Miramel and everyone at the city of Pasadena for this unique op opportunity uh, to present my capstone. I've spent really the past year working on this. And today really I'm gonna share with you a brief analysis of my research around the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect that it had on the Pasadena restaurant industry. And I'm gonna conclude with some of the recommendations that were offered in my report. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to say to everyone that I'm willing to share my report too as analysis or anything, um, it's public knowledge that I'm happy to share with. Uh, next slide. So in beginning my research, I want to get uh, an idea of what was the last major pandemic that really infected our nation. And the one that everyone's talked about since COVID-19 started was the flu epidemic, the flu pandemic of 1918. And just to give you a, a, a brief estimate, I mean, like this was something that was no joke. I mean, we're talking about over 50 million people were infected worldwide by the flu pandemic. And really it, it ended up uh, killing over 2.7% of the world population. In the United States, uh, over a quarter of the US population, which at that time was like 25 million people were infected by the flu pandemic. So it is something that is very similar and familiar about what we've been experiencing over this past year. What's even more interesting is sort of the state of how states and the, the government handled fighting this virus. Now in 1918, they took a lot of similar strategies that we have become accustomed to. Um, cities issued social distancing, uh, masks were proven mandatory uh, when you were walking around in public. There were lockdowns where you couldn't leave your house at a certain time. Sometimes cities took it a little bit further and actually issued citations and fines if you were caught out past a certain hour. But really if focusing on the effect that it had on the restaurant industry, uh, you have to understand that restaurants during this time were not like how we have become accustomed to restaurants in 2020. Right now, people are averaging going to a restaurant twice twice a week before uh, coronavirus. Before then, it was more of like a once a week thing, maybe. Um, to be honest with you, uh, restaurants were, there were only 100,000 restaurants uh, nationwide in the United States at this time, and they were mostly located within the city. And during this time, uh, they were really used uh, to feed workers. I mean, right now we're, we're accustomed to having the ability to work from home and have the ability to Zoom, have Zoom calls like we're having right now. But in 1918, workers still had to go to work. If you worked at a factory, we weren't accustomed to having all the workers' rights that we had, that we currently enjoy now. Workers still had to go to work, they had to eat, and sometimes they're getting off shifts at one in the morning and restaurants had to stay open in order to feed these people because they, they didn't have the, the luxuries to go home to a hot meal. And really it was also a place of socialization, like uh, restaurants still kind of remained open so that way people could still socialize or still be able to see other people because of the current state of how the lockdown was. So that's, that's really where uh, I started my research and getting an idea of how that how that virus impacted our, our nation, more specifically how it impacted the restaurant industry. Next slide. So in starting my research, I want to focus on the specifics of these three main questions when I was thinking about how the restaurant industry was going to be impacted by the coronavirus. And just to give you an idea, I mean, I was very fortunate to uh, have Pasadena take part in this research because they have such a long prominent history of being a hub of, re of for restaurants. If you can believe it or not, they're actually credited for the birth of the cheeseburger. Uh, so they, they have that, that long history of uh, being a, a hub for restaurants. And uh, really what I wanted to focus on is these three questions is what was the impact going to be on the restaurant industry? What are the pain points for uh, the businesses during this time. And then lastly, based off that, what can we recommend moving forward to help the restaurants move through and survive uh, their businesses during the coronavirus? And I'd really like to credit um, Steve Miramel, uh, Paul Little at the Pasadena Chamber, 
and Eric Dunsard at the Economic Development Office for really helping facilitate these uh, the questions and whatnot that we put out. And the, the research was really centered around speaking to restaurant owners, uh, Pasadena restaurant, uh, Pasadena residents through surveys. And uh, one thing I would like to preface before we start going into the results is that uh, these, this data was really captured between August and September of 2020. So just coming out of, of summer right before the winter months. Next slide. So the first question that I, uh, this, the first result is that um, I want to talk to the restaurant owners and really get an idea of uh, what was the impact. And as you can kind of see by the results, um, the, the feelings by the restaurant owners were really somewhat discouraged and neutral about how their feelings were about how their businesses were going to survive. And uh, this was a really interesting and big data for when I was looking at this because the restaurant industry is such a important part of the Pasadena economy. I mean, the sales tax is a big component and it's really, the restaurant industry makes up a perfect trifecta of the retail uh, hotels and restaurants so really make up a big portion of the sales tax that comes into the city. And even going into a deeper analysis and speaking to restaurant owners, the reason why this data showed uh, this discouragement really is because this was towards the end of the summer. Uh, we really had only experienced that first wave of the CARES Act that had come in through the federal government. Um, and really, uh, I think it, it came down to the consumers and I'll explain that in the next slide, if you could go to the next slide. The consumers as a whole also didn't feel all that uh, safe going back into restaurants. If you see, they were really concerned about the social distancing, um, the lack of uh, mask protection, human error, uh, sanitization, uh, uh, how clean the restaurants were. Uh, it was just a, a very uh, scary environment for consumers to feel comfortable, not for pickup, but for coming back, coming and sitting at restaurants. Now, if you think about it for, from a restaurant owner, from what we've learned is that restaurant owners really rely on people coming in to eat at their restaurants, but also the takeout orders and takeout orders was really their main focus of business at this time, but they were missing the in-person feel of consumers coming into the restaurant. And that was really a key uh, analysis of what I found of why there was that, that neutral feeling, but also this uncertainty about how the future of their business was going to be. Go to the next slide, please. Um, and that led me to question number two is, what were the main pain points for restaurant owners? And aside from the uh, restricted table space, um, sanitization was just like a really big, uh, really big issue at this point. Now, um, the table space too, mostly because during this time, LA County uh, still going through the tier system during the August to September months, um, they still could not allow any indoor table space. Uh, this was actually a good credit to Pasadena because they were one of the first cities to issue the outdoor dining program. I'm sure most of you kind of saw on the news where uh, main streets were used for table space that kind of helped in this process. But as a, as, a key, as a key pain point, they were still restricted by the overall capacity that they could have. They weren't having their normal level of uh, consumer base that they could come in with a full restaurant. And also um, just, uh, there was just a limitation of how much they could serve at that time while remaining uh, to the health standards that we had through the CDC and all through, throughout the state. Uh, next slide, please. So this, in, in keeping all this in mind, um, the last thing that I wanted to use as a tool before I created the recommendations is what type of recovery programs were going to be needed. Um, obviously, the, the first thing that, that came off is relief packages. And as I stated, this was a time where the CARES Act was, was down, so uh, restaurants didn't have that normal flux of being able to have access to those funds through the state of California. You have to remember at this time too, California was having to consider a lot of massive budget cuts because we were waiting to see on, on a budget being passed 
and also adding that extra flow of dollars into the CARES Act and a re relief package was something they were really much in need for. The table zones and also um, just going down the line, waiving city fees and workforce. Uh, but really, uh, before I got into my recommendations, um, I really wanted to work within the city. And to the city's credit, they did a lot. Uh, they really took this research to light when we were talking about the results. And the city of Pasadena really put forth um, a lot of relief packages of their own, not waiting for the, the state to kind of uh, have that money from the federal government. And uh, they put forth a lot of grants, a lot of micro grants. Uh, one of the big things, big elements that the city put forth um, was eliminating the fees for the dining, uh, for, the, for the sidewalk. Um, so that restaurant owners didn't have to pay fees for having access to the sidewalk and having that extra table space. Um, the last thing too, one of the very big hurdles that they put forth was um, a partial utility rebate, uh, which, which issued uh, two years partial back um, from the city surtax. So uh, that's really the ideas that I was coming forth when I was thinking about the recommendations that I wanted to put forth. Uh, I'll go on to the next slide. So in looking at that last slide, that's really where I started to capture my head about what type of recommendations um, should be, uh, should the city consider. And the one thing that I wanted to focus on is help where I help where we can. How can the city be helpful, but not also just throwing money at the situation? And um, the first thing that came to mind was uh, research through my research. I found that restaurants. Um, have to pay city and uh, say a city licensing fee and they also have to pay a good portion of health fees to the city every year and that that varies based off uh, how much money they bring in and there's different components to how that's calculated but if they miss those fees uh, if they miss those payments they have to pay a late fee and during this time restaurants were struggling to survive and I knew that they weren't going to be able to have to pay these they weren't going to be able to pay these fees on in a timely manner. So in waiving the late fees, it would give restaurants a little extra time to not only keep their businesses afloat and pay, pay their employees, but also have that ability to pay their regular licensing and health fees uh, when they could. And it wasn't, it was at a restricted time limit. I, we were holding it within like a six month time period and then having it be re revisited. But that was one of the first things um, where help could really be helped to the restaurant industry. And then the last thing, which was uh, the winter dining program, which I thought would be a really good added benefit uh, since grants were being issued by, this, by the city uh, and that the winter months were coming, restaurants weren't going to be able to have that luxury of having the outdoor dining because of the rain, because of the cold. So uh, some of the programs under the dining program that I thought would be of use to the city is allowing consumers to bring bring their own blankets to restaurants, to offer them grants, to have um, access to heating lamps, to having those outdoor cover covering areas that we that we saw during the past winter months. So that way, restaurants could continue to operate and maintain having an environment where it was safe social distancing could continue, but tables could also exist outside and that restaurants could continue to have the outside element of consumers eating their meals and maintaining their businesses. That would go to my next slide. And at this time, I would like to invite the rest of the panelists to join me for a discussion. Thank you, Greg. That was very insightful. And you gave me more reasons to love Pasadena. The fact that the cheeseburger was invented, Pasadena makes it uh, especially delightful now. So uh, I welcome all the panelists. And I think this is a good time to have our discussion. Greg has started us off with some good facts and figures and some insights. So let me turn to our friends from LAEDC and ask Ms. Shannon Sedwick to uh, you know, share some insights. They, they work with a larger canvas, they, they have more data and figures and insights to work with. So what are you seeing, Shannon, in terms of the last uh, one or two months? What business trends are you seeing, uh, maybe in particular the restaurant industry 
in LA County uh, that are similar or maybe diverge a little from what Greg has shared? Uh, sure. So just uh, just a little bit about uh, the restaurant industry in, in general during the pandemic. Um, it was one of the, the hardest hit industries during the pandemic. And as uh, Gregory mentioned early on, concerns about proper social distancing and possible transmission of the virus um, led to the shutdown of bars, breweries, tasting rooms, um, and the suspension of on-site dining options. So this restricted them to provide food and beverage services only uh, via drive-through or other pickup and delivery options. And only now are restrictions on indoor dining beginning to get lifted. So that's after a, a full year of reduced business uh, and profits. Um, in terms of jobs, uh, accommodation and food services is one of the largest in Los Angeles County. So pre-pandemic, it represented about 8% of total employment. Um, and through uh, the first couple of months of the pandemic, when the stay at home order, the safer at home order was um, the most severe, um, over 772,000 non-farm payroll jobs were lost in the county um, in the months of March and April. And food services and, and bars, so restaurants and bars, uh, lost just shy of 181,000 jobs over those two months in the county. And that accounted for roughly 23% of all the non-farm jobs that were lost over that period. Um, and so from May to March of this year, we have regained about 74,000 jobs back in this industry. Um, so that's just under 41% of the jobs that were lost in those two months that have been recovered thus far. So uh, by the end of August, um, you know, nationally, by the end of August, over 32,000 American restaurant businesses, they closed their doors. Um, and 61% of those indicated that that was a permanent closure. Um, so nationwide closures have been sustained for small businesses. Um, they experienced small food and accommodation businesses. They experienced higher sustained declines in revenue uh, than compared to other industries. Um, and in the months following the first series of closures across the US, um, net revenues for small food and accommodation businesses, they contracted by about 70%. Um, and those net revenues are still down about 60% as of February of this year. Um, and restaurants had to pivot. So what we did see was some resiliency in the industry as a result of these health orders. Um, and, and because they weren't able to operate on on premises, they expanded their off premises options. So, um, sixty seven percent of restaurant establishments they added curbside takeout. Uh, Twenty seven percent added third party delivery services. So these were options that they were um, reaching out and adopting in order to shore up and, and kind of um, you know stop the hemorrhaging of those lost revenues. is that it only made up a small amount of what those profits would have been otherwise. otherwise. Um, and fine dining really took the hardest hit in the restaurant industry. So um, overall, about half of the fine dining establishments, they reported that these additional off-premises sales, um, they only compensated for less than 10% of their lost business. Um, so in, in Los Angeles County, you're, you're asking about trends. Um, Full service restaurants, they were definitely hit the hardest across the county. Um, full service employment fell 65% um, from the start of the year uh, in April of 2020, and then remained about 40% below throughout the rest of the year. And limited service restaurants had a different experience. Um, they still were impacted. Um, and limited service restaurants also includes fast food. So they were still impacted, but they only fell by 28% from the beginning of the year to April. Um, and then they hovered roughly around 15% through the rest of the year. Um, so 
what we also saw was employment, it was and it is directly tied to changes in the health order. So we saw almost immediate changes in employment as restrictions eased or as they became more severe. Um, and the largest gains that we've seen um, have occurred when on-site uh, dining options have been allowed by health orders. Um, in January and February in, in Los Angeles County, we saw that job postings, which rep represents real time employer demand um, in the industry, they were predominantly for fast food and limited service dining options. Um, we do expect that occupations tied to on-site dining, such as hosts and hostesses, dishwashers, um, bartenders and barbacks, that they'll um, and other wait staff, additional wait staff, uh, will represent more recent openings as LA County Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for that very rich, uh, you know, data data source. Jessica, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, um, to put into context, then, so it was one. You know, we definitely took a look at the data, and the data told a great story. But we also convened the businesses um, throughout the pandemic to really understand their impact and uh, what the city of Pasadena is doing in response. Really does align to um, the concerns. So. You know, one was reduce the fees, right? So they, if they're open, they still have to pay 100% of their utility bills, their water bills and other things. And so if there could be a reduce or some type of subsidy um, was definitely top of mind for them. I'll also say rent protection and relief as well. Um, you know, if they're not open, but they still have to pay rent, how are they doing that as a business? And especially in certain corridors where it, it's way more challenging to open, where perhaps um, the foot traffic or the size of the business and the ability, if it's, you know, 25% opening, how many tables can you fit in a truly small business? Um, but also the modernization of the rules. So looking at the permitting, looking at the alcohol consumption, looking at the licensing, all of these things and what considers space for a restaurant, parking lots, and can we expand that? Um, as well as, of course, the alfresco dining. You know, the regulations around that one wall versus three walls and the changing orders. So if you're a small restaurant and you have invested to put up the appropriate public health, you know, and comply. And then because of the changing nature of COVID, the changing nature and the impacts that it has. So any type of subsidies to support that as well, um, but also protections in place. We talk about PPE and worker safety that Gregory mentioned. Now, absolutely, we need to make sure that our small businesses who are oftentimes being asked to purchase PPE in bulks that are too large um, that they have access to affordable PPE. But also, you know, when we went into the winter dining and the need for propane and outdoor heaters, the price gouging and the cost of propane and the investment in these restaurants to pay $1,000 a week for propane operating at less capacity, still bringing your workers and, you know, to then go into workforce, you know, the laying off, the rehiring, the retraining, the upskilling, the additional safety measures. These are all investments as an employer. Just imagine your own business. If you had to do that again and again, and the volatility and the unpredictability of coronavirus and if we'll have another surge and what that means. So also just as we think about credits for recruitment and onboarding and just you know the willingness for especially this industry to come to the table with government have these conversations, co-design, really understand and roll these out together this is definitely something. And, and lastly, I'll just say tips. You know, we, as we all know, um, hopefully you've also been generous as you've been dining out and, and tipping, but you know, there are a lot of taxes and laws related to that. And so we see cities like Pasadena, you know, really take a look at a robot, at the needs in a robust way and start tackling them as they make their investments but we'll also get federal investments that will come down. And so how we meet these businesses who've been disproportionately impacted by COVID and their unique needs, because they do have higher health standards than most businesses. They have a lot of regulation that comes into play. And so as we think towards summer, 
and the heat and we're turning off those heaters and and now we're thinking how are we going to keep people cool as we have alfresco dining and the tents perhaps or the shade that will be needed you know thinking of these businesses as partners as we invest in policies and regulations and incentives and think about the other kind of ancillary things that they also have to deal with are, are definitely um, things that I would suggest to cities to consider. Absolutely, no, thank you. Thank you for that contextual information. And I agree, I think in a public administration, what, what we're doing is called co-creating, right? Co-creating with the businesses and the government entities, and in our case, also a university contributing some ideas to the space. But I'd love to uh, hear from Steve in terms of his experience going through this and also still going through this process and also any reactions to the report itself. Thanks. You know, I really appreciated the work that Greg did. As he mentions, it was fairly early on in all of this. And the feedback is helpful as we continue to work with our local restaurants to try to chart a path forward. Restaurants are very important to Pasadena. We have a population in the city of just over 140,000 people, but pre-pandemic, we had about 550 restaurants, which I'm told on a per capita basis is more than New York. So it's a vital uh, part of our local economy. Some of the things that he pointed to that we did uh, to try to support our restaurants, and it's important to understand that at the same time, they're facing imminent financial crisis, so is local government. Uh, Pasadena in total between expenditures and lost revenues is about $70 million to today. So right at the time that local government's being asked to help support their local uh, businesses, they're taking a very big hit in loss of sales tax, parking citation revenue, parking uh, uh, fees, et cetera. So it's difficult. I'm proud of what we were able to do we own our own electric utility, and as Greg indicated, we rebated $11 million back to ratepayers. Now, for the average household, that might have only been about $100, $150, but for some of our restaurants, the rebates were in the thousands of dollars because it covered two years' worth of an underground surtax fee that we had, and many of the, and for most of them, the utilities are in their names. Also our city council, when they moved forward with a um, prohibition on evictions for residential, they also included commercial because that was a big concern. A lot of the restaurateurs were still having to pay their landlord, but they couldn't generate revenue. So our council included them on our eviction moratorium. The outdoor dining, I think is uh, something that a number of cities and thank goodness for our climate in Southern California, we can support it. You see these pictures of people in New York eating in these little pods in the snow. Uh, we have such pleasant weather and it's been a pretty light winter. We came forward, we closed uh, portions of the street, the sidewalk, we allowed businesses to convert their own parking lot. We reduced the uh, parking requirements to allow them to expand into their parking lots and operate. Uh, we rented the K rails to make sure it's safe. We went so far as to buy some of the K-Rail. And now the conversation is how much of this can sustain? How much can we can permanently convert street, sidewalk dining, private parking lots? I did hear anecdotally that one of our finer restaurants had as good a month now as they had in April, 2019. So that's good news. People want to come back and they want to enjoy. They missed fine dining experience. So we want to see how we can continue to support our local business community. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for that context. And as a Pasadena, former Pasadena resident and as someone who hangs out there quite often, I think yeah, you guys are doing a fantastic job. And uh, Greg, let me, let me turn to you again, just to circle back to see if there are any surprises during your research when you were conducting the survey or when you're interviewing people, anything that really stood out for you. And also subsequently, since you've done the report, have you found anything that, that's been sort of of interest? Yeah, so I had the, I had the pleasure of speaking to a lot of uh, Pasadena restaurant owners uh, throughout my research process. And I think um, the two things that I found that were really interesting were really the, um, the power that uh, the sanitization 
really played into the restaurant mindset. I mean, this was during the time when we were, when restaurants were looking for, how am I going to get plexiglass to have over the cashier register? Um, how, how much uh, Windex am I going to need to have? Or like, what type of chemicals can I have? How often are we going to have to clean the tables to make consumers feel a little bit more comfortable? I think one of the more interesting cases that I spoke to is uh, one restaurant owner actually like considered paying to have a fumigator come every week and just like blast the inside of his restaurant to like sanitize the whole place and then have it dry overnight and then have it like used again. So it was just really interesting to see the impact that's that how, how the level of safety that restaurant owners were trying to get to. And I think on the flip side to go back to one of my earlier slides, um, I'm not a restaurant business owner, but it was interesting to see really the level of impact that um, these fees that restaurants have to pay on a yearly basis, either health or business, uh, how much that, that uh, is carved out into their yearly budget of their business plan of what they have to account for when they're going through all the list items of things that they have to pay for. So it was really interesting to see how much, how high on their level of importance uh, of relief that they could uh, gain from having some type of help in that department. Um, I think in, in continuing on in this research, the one thing that is so interesting and unique about Pasadena is that they have a very large mom and pop uh, dining sector. Uh, I think a lot of us are more accustomed to driving down the street and seeing more fast food chains, McDonald's, things that there are multiple variations of. But in Pasadena, there's a lot of mom and pop family owned businesses. And I think in progressing the research, for me, I would really like to see how they're surviving the level of impact that they, that they have. I know um, Steve will tell you that Pasadena has a very prominent downtown area where a lot of those businesses reside. Um, so it would be interesting in continuing through this reopening process that we're going through as a nation and more specifically as California goes through it, the level of impact that they've faced and um, their level of needs moving forward to kind of attract the business back to those hubs of, of business. Well, thank you, Greg. That, that's very insightful. Um, and I think using that as a cue, let's talk a little about uh, the policies that the you know, local as well as state and potentially even federal government can put in place. We've seen a lot of action and also a lot of rhetoric around the policies that are needed, you know, in terms of tax rebates or, uh, you know, removing fees and giving, you know, a bit of leeway to the restaurants to spring back into action. I was wondering if uh, Jessica or Shannon or both of you can throw some light on that in terms of, I don't know if you've done any analysis in terms of what real impact do these policies have in terms of helping the restaurants come back to, to where they were. Shannon, do you wanna go first? No, okay. So uh, definitely policies have impact. So the investment that a company, especially our small restaurants have to make in order to comply with any policy is a financial investment. So when we've seen the volatility of this industry come up and down, as we've had to have more strict uh, regulations and close enclosures, uh, what ends up happening is that business has to retool and reinvest and rethink their strategy in order to comply with policies that are in place, but also do forecasting, right? Of course, as a business, you're gonna think into the future. And so as policies are put in place, and especially when there's a cost that is um, that a business must take on, I would highly recommend that you bring in your business community to have those conversations and really think through what are those solutions, what are the factors that perhaps we haven't considered. Because, like myself, you know, I, I've never operated a restaurant, so I'm not aware. But in the conversations from trash um, and the cost for that they pay around uh, trash to utilities to rent to fees to permitting, all of these things as we consider these policies have. Um, definite financial impacts for an industry that's already been significantly negatively impacted. And typically our small businesses have only a few months of um, capital at hand in order to weather the storm. 
And so I think as we look to policies and their changing means, that something we may have thought three months ago was a great solution is no longer a great solution for this industry. And unfortunately, it takes us time, right, to, to develop policies, to understand the economic impacts. Our cities, as Steve shared, are definitely hit. It's the same thing with our county. And so when we look at how we can support and leverage, especially, again, the federal funds that are coming down to support, it, it's really important for us to do that, let alone the targeted outreach to the most impacted businesses. I also will just share, you know, at, more recently with um, some of the funds coming down for any restaurants also on this call, the restaurant revitalization fund grants that are, that are open um, that just recently went live. I just really highlight that uh, our team at LAEDC partners with Pasadena, partners with the city, LA City and LA County to provide direct technical business assistance. So I will also just put in the chat um, the email for our co my colleague Bob, Bob Machuca, who um, services your region and can be available to answer any questions and help you navigate the system as well. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, just a quick reminder that you are you can put in your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to that in a minute. But I do want to get Steve's inputs if you'd like to add something. So, Sabith, on the regulatory side, I'd also mention two issues that came up uh, during this time was the, the big increase in the use of third-party delivery services. Mm -hmm. And a number of cities, I think the county of LA as well, moved to cap the fees on those services, terribly expensive for restaurants. And if they were to stay viable during the pandemic and probably post pandemic, they're going to need to be on those platforms. But uh, the fees that they're charged by those delivery services are pretty high. And that's an area where I think the state might need to take some interest to make sure that it's equitable across the board Another thing with so much of the offsite dining, dining out in the street and in the sidewalk, there is alcohol uh, uh, beverage control at the state level. Mm -hmm. And there's likely a need for some cleanup legislation that to the extent that these arrangements are going to continue out into the future, we need them to permit uh, the offsite consumption of alcohol out in the street and out on the sidewalk and on the parking lots. No, that's, that's very helpful. And I think uh, it, it's sort of anecdotal, but I think human research is validating this, that things will change in the future, right? In terms of both policy as well as practice of what is viable and what's needed for restaurants to thrive. I think that's a very, very important point to remember. Uh, and I, I, ha I do have questions coming in, but I, I wanna hold them off for just a few minutes to see if any of the panelists have any additional comments uh, Greg, do you want to add something to this? Um, maybe even as a consumer, if, if you've you know, experienced anything uh, in Pasadena from uh, either uh, you know, the regulatory perspective or any of the other angles we discussed. I think as far as the, the regulatory process, I think that as the rest of uh, the, the panelists have kind of spoken to the, the one thing that I am very fortunate have to have experienced during this, uh, this capstone assignment is really like building a relationship with the city of Pasadena, not only from the city side, getting their perspectives, but also speaking with the restaurant tours themselves and hearing like their pain points as well. And I think um, to echo what Jessica said early, it was really hard on restaurant tours themselves because the policies that were issued not only from the CDC and the state were changing day by day. So what would be issued as safe one day would be switched and then restaurateurs would have to make changes to their protocols. So it was a constantly changing environment about how to keep consumers safe, but also keeping their employees safe. And you, know, you saw a lot of that evident um, earlier on in the pandemic when um, if a cook got sick or if uh, someone within the facility got uh, sick, there was a lot of shutdown that had to go within the business community about how um, did the transference happen to me? Did it happen to people and the employees? And that would come back to, to the consumers 
to then echoing like, well, do we have to shut the restaurant down for two, two weeks or so to keep compliant, to keep safe? But also the, those words would kind of echo out through the community about, oh, COVID was at this restaurant, like you shouldn't go there. So those were just some of the like little instances that I saw, but I think what the restaurant tours really gravitated towards is that the communication component. And I really would say being part of the team and having that ability to communicate, but also seeing the level of communication that the city was doing on a daily basis, uh, having open forums and all that to keep them informed, help them have a level of safety and security um, outside of their own financial investment that they had in their restaurant, but having that connection to the city and knowing that there was the ability to know how to stay compliant, but also that there was a light at the end of the tunnel for their business uh, really stood as um, a good level of uh, a good level practice that uh, should be continued moving forward even after the, um, our, our open up orders that we'll be having next month. Absolutely. If I could just jump in on that, you know, the consumer confidence and the worker confidence to be safer at work is, is essential, you know, especially as we then, you know, want to invest in, in promoting LA County and Pasadena and Santa Monica and our hubs of tourism as we think about reopening up our economy as well. Um, so we also invested in a safer at work campaign. And so I, I will share that link in the box. It's a free resources for businesses to talk about their workplace safety to download some of these templates and customize it for your business. Because we know that a part of us staying open is that you know we, we are safe at work um, and that we keep safe at work. And so I also just wanted to share that to Gregory's point um, that it's a free resource for folks. Thank you, Jessica. And, and Sabif, I'd yeah. like to mention for those that don't know it, one of the things that positioned Pasadena well is we have our own health department. We're one of only three in the state, Long Beach and Berkeley. So that allowed for almost constant interactions between our health department staff and our restaurateurs. We were able to do numerous webinars or just one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, that allowed us, even when the county moved to close restaurants in November, we felt confident that we could visit enough of them that we could sustain it. Now, 10 days later, the governor shut everything down, uh, but we thought we had reached a pretty good uh, point where it was manageable at our level, and that was helpful. No, absolutely. I think that combined with better vaccinations, I think is helping a lot, right? I think growing vaccination rates. So that's great. Uh, let's, let's take some questions from the audience. I have a few lined up, and I think we need a little bit of time to get through them. So I have the first one from Stephanie Caldwell, who asks, uh, was there any data gathered on the number of restaurants that were shuttered uh, that shuttered operations permanently, and what what does it what what specifically led to that? So I suppose that is for Greg and Steve, and others can jump in on this as well. So based off my research um, as of September in 2020, and the, these numbers like could have changed. I knew that there were three restaurants or at least three main Pasadena restaurants that had um, closed permanently. And I know Steve can expand on that, but uh, Cafe 86, uh, Lincoln Pasadena, and then a sushi restaurant called Sushi, sushi Ichi um, were the three restaurants I know that had closed permanently. I know that there were estimates of, of others, but uh, maybe Steve can kind of expand on that. Were there any other restaurants that have closed permanently in Pasadena? as a result of, of COVID, but those were the three I know in speaking to those restaurant owners, those were the three that had said they were not coming back. Right, we don't have any definitive stats as of today, but it looks like the number is around 20 or so out of again, pre-pandemic number of about 550. I will say I was pleasantly surprised last week when I saw a, a restaurant uh, chain, which I thought had closed for good reopen and people were happily enjoying outdoor dining, including myself. So uh, maybe some of, some of it will spring back to life. You know, uh, the restaurant business is inherently challenging, even in good times, and many restaurants fail. It's not uncommon to see a restaurant operate 
for maybe a year, two years, and then, uh, and then sadly close. The demand is still there. I mean, as Greg pointed out, the average American is uh, picking up dinner, eating out at least twice a week. I've heard numbers higher than that in the past. So demand is gonna exist. And uh, we'd love to see the restaurants that have closed reopen. Uh, but sadly, if they can't, the expectation is, and we see all this pent up uh, desire to get back out there as vaccines are more available and people can socialize again, I'm confident that the uh, that industry is going to come back. Right. And you. in fact, Thank I understand you. that some of them I've talked to have had difficulty getting workers. That That is an issue uh, because while the government has stepped in to help people during difficult times, oddly, it also creates a little bit of a disincentive for people to go back to work knowing that they can stay at home, enjoy longer uh, benefits. Uh, and so some of the restaurants are struggling to find people. Absolutely. No, that's a good segue to our next question, Stephen. I'll actually keep you on the spot for this one as well, which is uh, with closure of some restaurants, of course, there's also an opportunity for some other restaurants to open up. So the question also from Stephanie is, uh, during uh, with the start of these, some of the newer restaurants, uh, what concessions or incentives did the city offer? Like, were you able to incentivize innovation or creation of new restaurants? Sure, well, again, I, I think maintaining areas of outdoor dining, which aren't exclusive to any particular restaurant, a more sort of common area is one way to help. Now, not every restaurant area is conducive to that, uh, but we've expanded our outdoor dining. Uh, and so we'll continue to do those things. Uh, it's also been interesting, and, and Greg's work touched on this, different types of restaurants were affected differently. Uh, <laughs> Right before that pandemic hit, there was a new concept on one of our uh, streets. It's about six little restaurants. It had some indoor dining, but most of it was to go. And ever since they've been able to operate, they've all been doing exceedingly well. So I think we're gonna see a little acceleration of the conversion of different types of dining. Fast casual has become very popular in recent years. Some fast food has fallen by the wayside. There'll always be a place for fine dining. So the shifts within the industry are going to be accelerated by all of this as well. Absolutely, absolutely. That's insightful. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, another question that's come in from Leo uh, and asks, uh, I wanted to know if targeted financial help versus the current company level aid package is viable. For instance, if a restaurant employee becomes infected with COVID and must quarantine or isolate, he or she is at a high risk of financial loss. Is it possible to direct owners or corporations to give certain payments to help sick workers? I think they're trying to talk about the government versus restaurant specific aid. So I was wondering if you want to speak to that or I, anyone on the panel would like to talk about uh, the incentives to get workers back in, in shape in terms of the work? Well, you know, the CARES Act required uh, employers to provide up to 80 hours of sick leave uh, for employees. Uh, in, for the city, as an employer, that cost us about three and a half million dollars. Uh, and so far, it's essentially an unfunded mandate, but it is a requirement that employers provide that. Uh, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. It's good for the employee to receive it. It can add an additional burden to the employer. Sure, sure. I can speak um, from the employee standpoint because I mm -hmm. actually had a lot of friends that work in the restaurant industry and the way that it kind of worked earlier on when we're talking about this is March is that the employer um, for main chains or even like uh, one-off chains would give employees um, the option to work or not work. Uh, one friend of mine uh, who works for Stacked said, um, you, you're, we're gonna start opening back up in June. You will be open for one month, which was like the extent of how long the CARES Act funding would have gone a little over the, than that. And you know, you'd still get paid, but we don't know how that will be after the fact. And so, but you had to make an, a decision within like the first couple of days, whether you're going to accept it or not. And if not, you go on unemployment, or if you do, you know, you, you don't have the 
comfortability of whether or not you'll have a job after the CARES Act funding went away. So a lot of employees were kind of caught, like a lot of my friends were kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. I need to make money and keep myself financially stable, but I'm also afraid of the virus. And you're working in a restaurant, you're working with food, you're working with a you know close proximity with a lot of people. The transference is a huge fear, especially earlier on in COVID was a huge fear in the restaurant employee sector. So a lot of people really just decided to take um, the, the dive and like go on unemployment and kind of wait it out because earlier on we were expected this was to go away by Easter. Now looking at it now almost over a year later, you know, that's, that's changed a lot. But the conditions that employees were kind of faced to be in was also a level of concern um, about making those tough decisions, unemployment or, you know, putting yourself at risk. And even in some cases um, throughout the county, uh, restaurant owners would send their employees home if they felt like they had COVID and they, they would get tested. If it was a negative test, a lot of the times they would just keep functioning as if nothing had happened. There were those protocols I know earlier on that we had, but if it was a negative test, it was like, okay, there's no, there's no level of transference or anything like that in the eyes of the, of the eyes of the owner. So let's just keep running as if uh, nothing's happened. Yeah, I think these are tough decisions to be made I think at, at every level. Um, but Steve uh, and Jessica also, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, cities and states are, of course, having to think of creative ways of raising revenue. So I'm, I'm uh, also interested in hearing your thoughts in terms of balancing budgets and maybe finding creative ways to, you know, finance these sorts of projects. And uh, I'm sure it's, it's not an easy task, but I was wondering if there are learnings from earlier incidents or similar you know, situations that you've examined, uh, if you have any insights to share. Sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at it first. One of the greatest challenges, local government is by definition local, it's accessible. So your local business community is going to turn to city hall and say, we need help. The challenge is the problem here was so profound that City Hall doesn't have the financial resources to assist. Now, luckily, the PPP came down and, and other federal support. Mm -hmm. So all the cities are doing what they can to assist. But clearly, this is an area where it's beyond our capacity. We need state support and federal support. Uh, we're happy that the federal government passed uh, relief and that we'll be seeing uh, a relatively uh, sizable amount of support as will other cities, uh, that will go some way to rebuilding our own reserves, which we depleted during this time. And we're hopeful that it will allow us to continue to offer programs, rental assistance and others to support our residents and our businesses. Uh, but the scale of the problem is so huge that there's limits to only so much local government can do. We have a vested interest in the success of our businesses and our residents uh, and so, uh, like all cities, Pasadena and others, scrambling to do what they can. But uh, I mean, this is you know of almost biblical proportions, and you need mm -hmm. a massive response. And I'm thankful that the federal government has provided that. Yeah, Steve said it perfectly, and I just layer on. You know, uh, government also needs the employees to be able to deliver services as well. And so when there's an impact to government in terms of their own ability to also, um, you know, staff up to meet such a huge need, there's an impact to services delivered. But both, you know, in, in advocacy, at least in terms of supporting uh, the response with this, whether at the state or the federal government, um, you know, it's ongoing conversations it's changing, it's looking at the numbers, forecasting, but you know, as Shannon can definitely attest to, it, there's nothing standard about what we're experiencing. So even the ability to forecast, can't forecast a huge spike in our numbers, which then calls for a huge, a, a different focus in the response that's, that's going on. And so I, I think the unpredictability of where we are, but thankfully, you know, at least for the restaurants, when I'm out and about, I'm seeing a lot more people out 
um, wanting to dine. And so hopefully we continue to be able to do that safely and it continues, we continue on an upward trend, but I will also say inclusively, um, mm -hmm. you know, the ability in some communities to recover, even if dining is available or some of the small businesses have been closed in certain neighborhoods more than others. Um, we also just as, as a region need to think about our inclusive economic recovery, that how we think about the party of our resources, the targeting, the assistance, the voices at the table, that we're also just making sure that we're doing it in an inclusive way so that we're not also having a recovery that's for two different folks, two different communities, um, but that we as a whole can, can leverage it to, to close some of the gaps that we have in our region as well. No, absolutely, Jessica, that's a great point. And I think it, it jives in with a lot of the research that's come out in the last couple of months saying, you know, certain minority communities have been disproportionately impacted by COVID and by health as well as the economic factors, right? Um, I think that's a good segue to one of our audience questions, which is from Lordana Carson. Dr. Lordana Carson was our faculty member. And she asks, does anyone know if restaurant employees are being asked or required to be vaccinated as a way of assuring customers of a safe dining experience? So this is open to anybody on the panel. As far as I know from my research, um, even continuing on past the project, nothing has mandated that you must get vaccinated. However, what is coming down the line, what's really interesting and is happening in states like New York is that um, there is talks of incentives that will be issued to businesses to get their employees vac vaccinated. So um, restaurant workers are included in that sector and this goes from bonuses to little salary boosts that will happen as a result of making the choice to get vaccinated. And of course, you'll have to show proof with your cards that you have, but those are sort of the talks that are happening right now because of the, the level of comfortability that's happening right now in the discussions about getting vaccinated. We're trying, there is, the, the main focus is to encourage as much of the workforce to take that step and get vaccinated, but there is nothing that has come out that is um, a legal mandate that says you must get vaccinated to go to work. My understanding is the EEOC has said that it's legal for an employer to mandate it, but it seems like a lot of employers uh, have shied away from that. And what we did here is we did some special clinics focusing on employees of restaurants. We did have cases of uh, communication of the disease in restaurants. It doesn't happen with the server and the customers. It's the people in the back of house that are standing next to each other for eight hours in close quarters working together. And so we focused primarily on, uh, on those people and then expanded to servers and others, again, as our way to help support uh, getting them up and running. I also had, I think the emergency use approval of our vaccines, there, there's legal related issues with the approval process. So I think also once it goes through um, kind of the regular approval process and we get that, I think it opens up the doors. At least my understanding is that it opens up the doors for businesses to also start to kind of require it. But also I'll just add, I mean, think about vaccines in schools and children and just traditionally what we had, I, I think it'll be more um, more than just a legal mandate. I think we're also going to have to think about, you know, the understanding of it and the campaign around it and, you know, people's proclivity to not want to be vaccined too. So I, I think it'll, as folks are thinking about policies as well, it's the education around it. Um, Cause I know even just with my own conversations with coworkers and folks who don't want to get the vaccine, I mean, as an employer, at least, you know, what do you say to that, right? Especially when there are laws in place and you want to be cautious about how you, how you move forward. Um, I think additional guidance on it, especially coming down from a federal government would be extremely helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, I think, uh, coming up with directives and people following them are two different things, right? I think implementation is, is quite tricky in this situation. Uh, and we do have a follow-up question on this exact topic from Leo, who's our MPPA graduate. 
and he asks, uh, what is the city doing in terms of restaurants who do not follow uh, masking or social distancing or occupancy limits? Uh, what, is, uh, what has been the city's approach uh, in, in ensuring that restaurants follow these rules? It's been a very delicate balance over the past, you know, 13, 14 months. Uh, we didn't, unlike 1918, Pasadena didn't write citations to people for not wearing masks. We did some public education campaigns where we handed out uh, business cards or offered people masks. But sadly, the political climate was such that some people are just outright aggressive and we had to move away from some of those direct contact efforts, instead relying on messaging through social media and billboards and, and other things. In terms of enforcement with uh, restaurants and other businesses, uh, we would rely on warnings. Uh, employees of those businesses would often think off their employers to the city. And again, being a relatively medium-sized city, we can go out and we can check a business, whether it be a retail business or a restaurant. And we would send a letter uh, letting them know that there's been a complaint or a concern raised. And only if they didn't address it, would we move further ahead in terms of citations. We did have to close a number of restaurants when, they're, when there was that initial reopening because they just wouldn't follow the protocol. Because uh, it's a relatively small population here in the city, you close a couple of them and they all know. And that makes it clear that the city means business. We can't risk people's health and we don't wanna close businesses, uh, but we have to ensure that the protocols are being adhered to. And even in those cases where we did close businesses, say on a Friday night, we were willing to have an office hearing with them on Saturday and Sunday, get them reopened. But the point is they need to understand that they have an obligation here as well. And 99% you know, of all the restaurateurs were great. They understood they don't want to harm their own business reputation. So they worked well with us. But it really was a delicate balancing act uh, throughout all this in terms of enforcement. And you have members of your community who we all hear from who say, you're not being hard enough. I saw a person walking around the Rose Bowl without a mask, go arrest them. To other people who say, none of this is real. It doesn't matter. It's just a cold. What are you doing? You're being uh, overwrought. So a uh, tricky spot for all of us local government regulators to be in. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't envy you for being in that situation, but I'm sure you've, you've grown wiser over the last 14 months. Certainly grayer. <laughs> for sure. For sure. All right, folks, we do have uh, time for maybe one more question. If there's something that comes in. Uh, we, we can start wrapping up this very, very enriching and insightful webinar. Uh, any final questions, please type away. We do have a few minutes, but I do want to give the opportunity to any of the panelists who have any closing remarks, any reflections that they want to share before we wrap up. I would just encourage everyone to come to Pasadena for dinner. Absolutely. I completely second that. I go with my wife quite regularly to Pasadena. And while you're there, visit Arcadia, the LA Arboretum, which has about more than 300 free roaming peacocks. So it's quite a delight now to see them and lots of flowers to, to also see. So yeah, check it out. Definitely eat in Pasadena and support the local economy. So folks, this has been incredibly good. Thank you again so much for taking the time. And in particular, our friends from LAEDC, Jessica and Shannon, uh, Steve, who's also, I forgot to introduce him as uh, actually one of our adjuncts. He teaches us in our program. And Greg, again, congratulations, fantastic work. Uh, and I think uh, we are here because of you in some ways. So congratulations again. Uh, I do want to mention the next uh, uh, Forward Together webinar uh, taking place on May 12th on cryptocurrency and the very personal story behind the crypto company. Uh, so please register on our website and we hope you can join us. And thank, thank you all again for being here with us. Have a good evening. We thank you for participating in today's Forward Together webinar series, brought to you by the School of Management at California Lutheran University. The School of Management offers a broad range of programs and community services. 
Whether you're looking to upgrade your career, locate current economic data from our Center for Economic Research and Forecasting, or a place to start and grow your business at Hub 101, our community startup space, we invite you to visit us at clu.edu slash som and join the community as we move forward together.